Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome to episode 153 of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Of course, I am your host, Rick Doherty. On the show today, my good friend Scott Kumka will be here to talk about his various attempts to raise money for Give Kids the World. Back in November, Scott attempted to visit every resort on Walt Disney World property, and he's already completed the Every Ride Challenge at Walt Disney World. We're going to talk about his resort hopping day and how the changes to the park hopping rules will help more people complete the Every Ride Challenge. Let's get right to it. Thanks for being here, Scott. Thank you. Nice to be here. So the first thing I want to discuss with you is to raise money for Give Kids the World back in November. You did not the Every Ride Challenge, which people have done, and we're going to talk about the Every Ride Challenge in a little bit. But you hit every Walt Disney World resort, and I don't think people really understand how daunting of a task it is to do that. So first of all, I want to talk about how many resorts there are on property, how many resorts you wanted to try to hit in this one calendar day. Um, There are, depending on how you count it, there's... 21 official Disney Disney resorts. I did 23 because I also did the Swan and Dolphin, which are they're very big hotels and they're very much a part of the Crescent Lake area. So there's like I couldn't not do those. So there was 23 that I went to. Yeah, I don't know how many people realize that the Swan and Dolphin aren't technically Disney hotels, but that's a whole nother story for another time. But you oh. did them anyway. So that means you were doing about 23 resort hotels. I know that there's a little bit of a caveat that you want to say that you kind of cheated with one. The one that I didn't really set foot on was um, Port Orleans French Quarter. I was at Port Orleans Riverside. I ended up waiting about a full hour to get on the boat that was going down to Disney Springs. And with the, the time limit that I was giving myself, there wasn't any way to really get off and still make it to that hotel. If I would have gotten out of line and actually walked over there, it actually probably would have been, I might've actually made it because the line at, at the French quarter was about an eighth of the line at Riverside. So <laughs> That's okay. I think anybody who knows French quarter and Riverside knows that Port Orleans area. When you were taking the boat, you were, basically in Port Orleans French Quarter. You just weren't on the ground. You were going past it on a boat. So so I did get pictures of the resort, but I wasn't really at the resort. I would consider that you being at the resort. I'm going to count it. <laughs> so when you're looking at doing this, I think a lot of people who are listening know that these resorts are spread out you know, what is it, two times the size of Manhattan or whatever. These resorts are spread out over a big space. And sometimes it can be a hassle just to get to some of them, like the monorail resorts that don't necessarily want you parking. And we'll get into all of that in a little bit. But when you were creating your strategy for how to try to get all of these done, Which ones did you want to do earlier and which ones did you think it would be better to do later in the day? The big thing for me was basically there's four areas of resorts. There's basically the Animal Kingdom area. There's the Magic Kingdom monorail loop. There is the Epcot Crescent Lake. And then there's basically what's called the uh, Sasagula River, which is Port Orleans down to Disney Springs. Um, So I wanted to start in one of the farthest corners possible which would either be Saratoga Springs, the Animal Kingdom Lodge, the Polly, or I guess Fort Wilderness would be the one on the the farthest on the northeast side. So which one did you end up picking to do first? Uh, I went with the Animal Kingdom Lodge because that's the one that's farthest out. You have to basically have your own car or take a bus basically from probably Animal Kingdom. My biggest problem, because I basically decided to do this Friday night before, there were no park reservations, so I could not park at a at a theme park. I had to park at one of the hotels. 
Okay. Wow. All right. So you ended up starting at Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, which, by the way, if you haven't taken the time, go to this resort because it is amazing. But I think it was probably the best choice because it is really, really out of the way when you consider even getting to Animal Kingdom, it's still a decent bus ride. Yeah. It's about it's it's about half a mile past the Animal Kingdom going west. It's like it's the farthest thing out on property. Part of that is because they have the animals and those animals need to be able to be away from a lot of the light resolution and stuff like that. And of course the fireworks and those things. So it is definitely tucked in there in the back. And then I saw, I believe then you went to the all stars. They let you park at the all stars. <laughs> yeah. The animal kingdom. They, they asked me like, what, what was I doing there? I told them I was eating at Sanaa, which I wasn't <laughs> uh, the animal kingdom. They were okay with me parking there. Cause you're not generally going to be going to a park from there. Correct. You're not trying to beat the system. And the All Stars went to the guard gate. They were like, "You want to do what? You just want to look around? Go ahead." <laughs> they didn't care. Yeah, not a lot of people are going to the All Star resorts for any nefarious purposes. Because, like you said, the thing they're really That's worried about is you taking advantage of the resort transportation and maybe trying to get free parking. And while I guess you could get free parking for the theme parks by parking at the All Stars, yeah, that's that's one of the worst bus systems, honestly. Right, you're gonna <laughs> wait a long time for the buses. They're gonna check cars periodically. Like you're not gonna be able to spend the whole day at the parks. But if you want to go there and eat at one of the food courts or look around at some of the decorations and things like that you can do that pretty easily at the All-Stars. And this was probably super easy for you because you can just walk in between the three resorts. That is what I was doing, but I kind of had to use uh, like Google Maps to figure out where, which, what was the shortest route to walk through the three different, between the, the sports, the music, and movies. And the thing is, in each hotel, this, this is the one thing I got to point out to people. I was trying to get the most iconic part of each hotel as much as possible which means not just like walking in taking a picture of the sign and going away i like i went to the football field and the, and the sports one the music one is the broadway one and i think the country one and the movies one i did the love bug and the fantasia hotel yeah i definitely think that the love bug is the coolest feature that they have herbie the love bug there in the winner's circle at all-star movies so that's cool. Then you got to bang out those. And do you consider Coronado part of the Animal Kingdom section? Besides the Animal Kingdom Lodge, Coronado's probably the most isolated of all the other hotels because it has, it's also bus only. Because um, all the other hotels either have a monorail, a boat, a uh, Skyliner. At the All Stars, though, my, my, I was having a little bit of issues with my car. I had a check engine light that I found out was because I actually had low fuel. <laughs> Late, later in the day but it's like so i'm like do where do i want to park where do i want to leave my car and where can i start using disney's transportation so um i went from the all-star to coronado coronado i actually didn't stop at the gate at the guard gate because there is a convention center there correct so i parked at the convention center because there's nothing blocking you from parking there coronado springs is a very different resort in many ways than the other resorts on property. This is the least park focused. It's a very much a convention hotel. Right. And they have a lot of lounges and they have a lot of restaurants. There are restaurants like three bridges where they don't even do reservations. So it's right. not like you could have a reservation for three bridges. They want you to go to this resort because there is a lot to do, especially for locals. So this is one that oh. you can kind of park and the buses aren't great. So it's not no. like you're really going to take advantage of the bus system. Um, Cause this was like, you know, this is only the fourth, third, fourth hotel I was at. Nothing was open yet. Cause it was only like 10 in the morning still at this point for the Coronado. The most iconic part is the pyramid at their pool, which is at the farthest point 
in the re in the complex for yeah, them. That's true. I'm basically I'm basically by the Destino Tower, the convention center. It's that's at one end, and I had to walk all the way to the other end to get the picture I wanted. Yeah, that pool is fantastic, and it was probably good that you went early in the day because the pool gets super crowded and you don't want kids in your picture and stuff like that. So going right. there early was definitely a way and to avoid that. I was still using my car. I, I, I was looking through the, while well, I was walking through Coronado, I was kind of looking through the Disney reservations. So I've seen like what was available for breakfast, which was kind of deciding where I was going to head next. One thing that popped up, which I kind of kicking myself that I didn't do, even though it wasn't breakfast was a hoop to do review <laughs> popped up. We're willing to slide. I'm, I was like, should I do that? But that's it's like, I probably wouldn't have been able to finish the challenge if I would have done that. But the other thing that popped up was Whispering Canyon Cafe. So that's what I went and did for breakfast. That's a really, really good breakfast too. Yeah, two, two, two skillets worth of bacon. <laughs> yeah, that's always good. When you have the all you care to enjoy skillets, that is fantastic way to start your day, especially if you're doing what you're doing when you're running around and you don't know how many times you're going to have to stop to get food, you want to eat a lot every time. And that's, and that's pretty much the only food I had until I started heading back home. So <laughs> when we talk about doing a resort hopping wilderness lodge is my favorite resort on property. I just that's love it there. And I'm kind of impressed that you still went about your journey and you didn't just sit down in that lobby and enjoy the fireplaces. Um, that was interesting. Um, the fireplace, I, I posted some of these pictures on a Facebook group called the society of explorers and adventurers. There was a guy that actually posted a thing about my father helped set up what the actual fireplace in, in the grand Canyon national park. He, they had, they have a very similar thing. And he said his grandfather got to make that. I was like, Oh, that's, you know, it's interesting getting to doing these things for Disney and finding how you connect to stuff outside the Disney bubble. Right. And that's really cool, too, because A, it shows how Disney has this attention to detail that it is based on something outside of the parks. And it does bring that outside world of travel into the Disney parks. Was that what you considered to be? the most iconic thing at Wilderness Lodge, the fireplace? Um, I went with the fireplace. I also did the totem pole in front of the gift shop. Just a little goofy picture. That if I would have gotten it. that, if I would have hit it at the right time, just because of breakfast, the breakfast took a little longer than I was expecting. It took about an hour. I didn't quite hit. The other thing I would have went for was the um, get a shot with the geyser. Correct. Wasn't going off the time I passed by there. So No, and I think that the fireplace counts as the iconic thing at that resort. I definitely feel like when I think of Wilderness Lodge, I think of that big fireplace. So where did you go next? You said you had trouble getting to Fort Wilderness. So did well, you that, not go there next? Well, that's the thing is I, I left my car at, at the Wilderness Lodge all day long at that point. I went out to the boat docks. That's why I was, you know, the guys that the geysers. I'm walking up the boat docks. There's two different flags for the boats there. One that goes to the Wilderness Lodge and the Contemporary. One that goes to the Magic Kingdom, Grand Floridian, Polly. Unfortunately, the one that was going to the Wilderness Lodge didn't start until 3.30. Fort Wilderness, this, but I understand what you're... Oh, sorry, sorry, Fort, Fort Wilderness. Right. <laughs> so it's like, it's okay, so I had to decide, so I had to go to, I was going to the monorail loop. Okay, so, cool. So you get to bang out three pretty quickly then, I would imagine, right? Uh, fairly quickly, except, yeah, I went from the Wilderness Lodge to, actually, to the Magic Kingdom. I got off there and got on the monorail to the Contemporary, because I was, figured that was actually going to be the fastest way to travel. Yes. So I stopped, you know, did the Contemporary actually stop for a drink at the Outer Rim Lounge? Ooh, sneaky good lounge, by the way. They yeah. reopened this. I mean, it's probably been a while now, but I remember that this wasn't open for a while. And now that it's back, I am really excited about that. Definitely a good place to get a drink when you are close to the theme park. Actually, if you weren't doing this challenge, the Contemporary, you can literally walk there from Magic Kingdom if you want to you, take a break you, in the middle of the day. I, I'm debating whether do I want to take the monorail or walk there. I figured it's probably fast. At the time, it was probably fast to take the monorail. 
because early in the morning, the round monorails are running pretty quick. If you go later in the afternoon, not as much. Correct. And not many people are going from Magic Kingdom to the Contemporary at that time in the morning. Right. They're more going to Magic Kingdom. So definitely yeah. the smart choice there. And then did you just go to the Poly and to the Grand right after that? Yes. What did you Although consider the-, the iconic feature of all three of those resorts? Uh, for the, the Contemporary, obviously, there's the Mary Blair Mural and the Grand Canyon Concourse. Um, in the Poly, it was the statue of Maui. Okay. I know yep. people, if people don't, don't know that that's supposed to be Maui, that the little, the little guy in the, in the center of the lobby, that's Maui. Yeah, long before Moana and yeah. that movie, Maui had always been in the Polynesian. And then for the Grand Floridian, I basically just took a shot of the lobby, like from the, the top. But I went downstairs because they had just opened the uh, gingerbread house. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you got to love that. Uh, I would have gotten something from the gingerbread house, but I was asking people around. It was about a 90 minute wait for a gingerbread cookie. I am not waiting 90 minutes for a gingerbread cookie. You know, I'm going to say something that might be an unpopular opinion. I love to look at the gingerbread house. I hate all the things they have for sale there. <laughs> yeah, that, and actually even in the contemporary, they were starting to set up a like gingerbread thing. Yeah, the Grand, they try to get that one done first because that's the biggest one. That's the biggest draw. And that's the one when, as soon as you walk into the Grand now, that's all you smell as soon as you walk into the Grand Floridian is just that gingerbread smell. Yeah, I think that I would say the Grand Floridian lobby is the iconic shot there. If I was going to go a little more specific, I might say the piano in the lobby. Well, I was trying to get the uh, the elevator in the back, the, the, the open air elevator. You have the open air elevator and you have the the uh, the bird cage, the aviary, which I don't think they have any birds in there anymore. <laughs> I don't know if they ever did. No, those are definitely some good options. So where did you go next? I'm assuming from the Grand, you took a bus to somewhere else. Yeah, from the Grand, I took a bus to, I'm trying to remember now. I'll tell you what I would have done and I'll see if this is what you did. I would have taken a bus to Hollywood Studios and then hit the Crescent Lake Epcot Resorts. No, I did take it to the studios. You were right on that, now that you said that. Then I got on the Skyliner, and I headed all the way out to um, the Pop and Art of Animation. That actually makes sense. I see why you did that now, because then you're going to end up by Epcot, and then you can hit the Crescent one. So, okay, what did you consider the iconic location at Pop Century? I did the one with uh, Baloo and Mowgli. Okay. Oh, and the one that I, to me is the icon is the Mickey Mouse phone. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. And then over at Art of Animation, did you just pick something like? Uh, the Art of Animation, I went to Radiator Springs. Gotcha. Because so I got a couple of pictures with a couple of the different cars. Plus there's like a big billboard. I got a picture with a billboard that says Radiator Springs. You know, this is something that I think families might not know. If you're on vacation, especially since Hollywood Studios, like it's a full day park, but you might need a break if you want to make it all the way to Fantasmic and seeing some of these lands at night. I think heading over to Art of Animation in the middle of the day and taking the Skyliner and your kids can get their picture with Lightning McQueen on Route 66, the Little Mermaid statues. Like, these are really, really photogenic things, and they are just a quick five minutes away on the Skyliner from Hollywood Studios. They used to do a drawing class at the Art of Animation. Um, I did find their, their sign for their schedule. Apparently, they only do the drawing class on Tuesdays now. So I was there Saturday. Do you have to I be guess, staying at Art of Animation to do it, though? No, because I've done it a few times there. Okay, before. awesome. So usually about 30 people maybe standing around. It's just one artist on a TV screen, but it's it's fun. They like I've done Mike and Sully, and I did a few others before. I don't remember what the other ones were. That's another thing to keep in mind if you are a family and you're visiting on a Tuesday you're at Hollywood Studios, go over, try to do this animation class. So that is another really, really good tip. So I'm almost 100% sure your next stops in order were Caribbean Beach and the Riviera. Yes. 
Uh, the Caribbean beach, basically I used the pirate theme pool that they have as the icon, because that's pretty much what you would think of Caribbean beach. You see the, you see the different color, the different islands, but the, the pool is basically their the iconic part. I would say uh, either that or the lighthouse, but those are both really good choices. And then right. heading over to the Riviera, which unfortunately looks like an office building to me. There, I don't think there, there's, there's anything not, iconic about that building at all. That one I was trying to do. I did. They do have a pool that's kind of like the Fantasia, the Dance of the Hours. So I, kind of, I got a picture with that. Got a picture with the bocce ball court. You know what I would have done? And I don't blame you if you didn't do this. I would have gone to the lounge where they have Walt's hat. Okay. I went up to there to the lounge. This is the this is the fun part. I didn't know they were doing this at the time. I just happened to walk in at the perfect time. They just had started a trivia contest. Oh, cool! Fifteen questions and two or three bonus points, depending on how you did the answers to some of the questions. I got seventeen out of the eighteen possible points, but I had the highest number, so I won the trivia contest there. Oh, cool! So, what was the one you didn't get? I got the question. It was, um, what's the name of the store in Frozen that Anna goes to? Okay. Which is Wandering Oakens. I would have known that. They wanted the full name, Wandering Oakens Outpost and Spa. If you put the full name, they would have given you a bonus point. All right. I got you. Well, that makes sense why you didn't get that one. And then did you go from the Riviera all the way to Epcot at that point? Yeah, I got back on the Skyliner to... Yeah, basically over to the Yacht and Beach Club. Correct. You get off at Epcot and you, you head towards the Yacht and Beach Club. I have, you have a choice of going either to the, head towards the boardwalk or the Yacht and Beach Club. I went to the Yacht and Beach Club. I would have done that um, too because you can really quickly hit Beach Club, then Yacht Club, and then the Swan and Dolphin, and then loop back around to Boardwalk. And right. I think that's the best way to do it and kind of go against the traffic going to epcot (laughs) right so i do want to ask before we go to any more resorts was it the lighthouse what you considered the icon at yacht club yacht club i did take a picture of the lighthouse i also took a picture with uh, storm along bay yeah the pool with with the big boat and then also inside the yacht club um there is a giant globe yep okay I also took a picture with that. What did you consider the swan and dolphin icons? I, well, I did take a picture outside the hotel. And then when I went inside, there is there are some fountains that are like the dolphin one has a couple of in the center where it's, you know, the dolphin statues. And the, there's a bunch of dolphin statues all over the place. Right. But I mean, <laughs> basically tried to get to the center of the, of the resort. So the icon at the boardwalk, did you say that was the pool or is that the room with the radios? Or um, is it the scary chair? The scary chair would be... I, actually, what I did was the... Um, there's an encased carousel. Okay. There's That's kind of what I, I did that. And the, there's also a roller coaster. I guess I could have done... I forgot about the scary chairs. Otherwise, I might have actually done those. <laughs> They're called nanny chairs. The thing I love at the boardwalk as a radio nerd is they have radios in the lounge that are all playing like old... 40s and 50s broadcasts from towns on boardwalks in i think it's mostly new jersey but they have these old radio broadcasts it's amazing so scott i didn't even realize i was going to find this so interesting and that we were going to talk about this for so long so what i want to do is just very quickly have you go over the other resorts you hit for the end of the night because i want to move and talk about the park hopping rules that are about to change. So why don't okay. you just quickly blow through those last couple of resorts? Tell me how you got there, what you thought was the icon, and then we're going to talk about park hopping and the new rule changes. I went from the boardwalk to um, Port Orleans Riverside. Um, Riverside, the icon there was um, there's a big water wheel and a water tower there. Those are the icons of that resort. Got on the Sassagoula River to cruise, waited an hour for that. <laughs> yeah, floated by Port Orleans French Quarter. This is when I was invited down to Disney Springs. Ended up going to uh, Art Smith's homecoming with a few other people from Twitter that met up there. 
the biggest one being Nomad Lounger. You know who he is? I, actually, I know I know you know who he is. Cause I... Right. <laughs> I have been kissed, and that picture is on Twitter right now by Nomad Lounger. So, <laughs> yeah, so then you headed to Disney Springs. Actually, before Spring, as I got off at Springs, um, the boat dropped me off by the Rainforest Cafe. So I'm like, okay, Rainforest Cafe's here. Saratoga Springs is right there. So I, like, walked over. I have no idea what the icon is. I've even stayed at Saratoga Springs. I have no idea what the icon is. I just took a picture by one of the rooms, basically. Okay, yeah, I'm at Saratoga Springs. Okay, I I would have gone with the horse that's right outside the main entrance. Like, there's a horse statue right there. But, you know, whatever. It's not really a big deal. That's actually where I stayed my first day back after the pandemic closures. I stayed four straight nights there. So I was able to go to all four of the parks with reservations in that first week after they reopened. So that was pretty cool. Just a little side tangent there. <laughs> so went to homecoming. And then um, at that point I thought, Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was super late. I wasn't going to complete it. It was only eight o'clock. It's just because it got dark so fast because of the time change. My goal is basically I have to get there before any of the restaurants close in any of the hotels. Latest one was 11 o'clock. I got on a bus to for wilderness luckily on the bus i got i met a couple there they're like oh we have a golf cart so they were able to take me on the golf cart from the bus stop at Fort wilderness up to pioneer hall awesome awesome that's really helpful then <laughs> yeah so the, of course the icon there of course is pioneer hall that is basically the icon of wilderness uh, not Wil- fort wilderness yeah i mean there's not a lot of stuff happening the, at fort wilderness because of its purpose <laughs> it's a campground so was that your last one, or did you hit Old Key no. West? I did get to Old Key West. Um, I took the boat, again, back to, remember, my car was parked at the Wilderness Lodge. So I took the boat back from Fort Wilderness over to the Wilderness Lodge, ran through there, and drove down to, unfortunately, I made a wrong turn, drove all the way down to Disney Springs, then <laughs> to come back up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, got, I went into uh, Old Key West and ended up at the at the end of the night having a drink at the bar called the Gurgling Suitcase. Was there a reason you decided not to just walk over from Saratoga Springs? Did you think that was going to take too much time, um, or did you want to get look. back to meet people in Springs? No, no, no. I had to look at Saratoga Springs. There wasn't a very convenient way to get to Old Key West from the Saratoga Springs. Okay, that makes sense. Right. All right. Now I want to turn our focus a little bit. You did this resort challenge for Give Kids the World. There's going to be a link in the description to this podcast where you can donate to Scott's page. But what you have done before, and you have completed it twice, I believe. Is that correct? I've completed it three times here in Walt Disney World and once out at the Disneyland Resort. And you do the every ride challenge, which was definitely hindered over the past few years when you're talking about the park hopping rules, where even right now, you're not allowed to park hop until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That is going to change. That is going away on the 9th, where now all you're going to have to do as an annual pass holder like Scott or myself is you will have to still make a reservation for your first park, and you do have to start at that park, but you can park hop immediately, which means that, let's say, it's hard to get a reservation for Magic Kingdom, and you just want to quickly make an Animal Kingdom one, and you can scan your band and go head over to Magic Kingdom Um, if you want. (laughs) There are two rides that kind of limit you to either Magic Kingdom or uh, Epcot at the moment, though. That being, of course, Tron. As long as they're still doing the the virtual queue, you can you can get individual lightning lanes. But if you want to not pay the twenty thirty dollars that Disney charges, you either got to try to get the one at the Tron, or you have to try to get um, at Epcot the Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, yeah. So now we're going to get into the every ride challenge a little bit here. So let's say that you make your park pass reservation for. Let's say Epcot. Let's pretend that it's a late night at Magic Kingdom. Magic Kingdom is going to be staying open till midnight. So you make your park pass reservation for Epcot so you can get that boarding group for Guardians of the Galaxy. 
and then try to get to Magic Kingdom to get the one o'clock drop, or do you just suck it up and pay the price at that point? Um, most people try um, usually just pay for the the individual Lightning Lane because that way you can kind of pick the time that you want. Where if you're waiting for the drop, you may get stuck at a time you don't want. That's true. That's true. I can see that, especially with Tron, because they are much stricter about what time you use your right and i've actually saw there was someone running a couple weeks ago that they were almost too long they they were the next group to be called at the end of the night and they cut off the line and so they weren't able to complete it oh man that is a drag so what do you think just in general about these park hopping rules being gone i know that a lot of the reason you're happy about it is because of the every ride challenge but of all the Um, people i know on twitter you were kind of like the most frustrated about the park hopping rules not only that not not just even the ride challenge it's also like if you go to the magic kingdom magic kingdom sucks for food yep you go to epcot and there's 20 great restaurants you can pick from there you go to even the animal kingdom there's a couple really good restaurants you can pick from studios there's still a few there too um, but the magic kingdom is the worst i also think that magic kingdom has a tendency to open either the earliest or the second earliest in the morning right after animal kingdom but yeah, also stay open the latest some nights so it does make sense if you want to rope drop magic kingdom get a bunch of rides out of the way really early in the morning and then head over to animal kingdom at about 10 o'clock when right. the crowds really start to show up at magic kingdom. Yeah. And also magic kingdom has what we call early closers, the riverboat, um, the train, they close at like six or seven o'clock, even on nights when they're open till midnight, those two rides close early. Absolutely. Yeah. That is a good point as well. Now that's one thing if you're out at Disneyland though, They close down for the fireworks, but Disneyland, they reopen their railroad. Well, yeah, their railroad is much more substantial to the park than the Walt Disney World railroad is. There's a lot more to see along that track than there is the Magic Kingdom. Magic Kingdom, a lot of bushes. Especially at night, it wouldn't be that exciting at Magic Kingdom, unlike when you go through the dioramas and things like that over in Disneyland. So would that be what you would probably try to do the next time you try to do a ride challenge? You would start it at Magic Kingdom or would you start Um, it somewhere else? Most likely Magic because you also have the vehicles on Main Street, which generally only run less than the first hour of the day. Yeah, they shut those down quick. (laughs) I've only done them like once or twice because that's how quickly they do shut them down for the day. That's also another Disney World versus Disneyland. Disney World, they shut them down quick. Disneyland, they're running all day long. (laughs) There's a lot of things better at Disneyland. Like, we're not going to have that discussion right now. But, Scott, I tell you what, this was a much longer conversation than I expect. I really appreciate you hanging out with me a little longer than I thought. And I'm going to have the link to your Every Ride Challenge page in the description give kids the world just let everybody know what they do very very quickly i think most people know but you know you can give them a little refresher yeah give kids the world they have a uh, complex out in Kissimmee. it's a bunch of housing for um critically ill children mostly the children from uh, make-a-wish like when kids wish that they want to go to disney or universal they get housing out at the village for a full week For the kids and their family, every child out there gets at least two days of Disney, two days Universal, one day of SeaWorld, if they want it. Um, Plus the village itself, they have rides and and, um, both like Disney and Universal, they, for like the children that can't make it to the parks because of their illness, they send characters to the village. And each day they do different things, like one day's Christmas, one day's Halloween, one day's a birthday party. A lot of fun stuff for the kids out there. Yeah, they will celebrate your birthday no matter when your birthday is during the year, you could have a June birthday and be there in January and they're going to celebrate your birthday that day. I think the other thing that they really like to push is that you can have ice cream at any time of the day. The Henry Starlight Scoops, which is the only thing that has ever been uh, created 
uh, with a joint venture between Disney Imagineering and Universal Creative. Oh, wow. What a great piece of trivia to end this episode. I love that one, man. Scott, thank you so much for all that you do trying to raise money for Give Kids the World. And thanks for being on the show. Thank you. This has been episode 153 of Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Do me a favor and take 30 seconds to make sure you're subscribed to the Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty YouTube channel. While you're there, comment on some videos and podcasts. We want to continue to grow this. I'll be back next Thursday with Sarah Says. The two of us are going to pick the five best times to visit Walt Disney World in 2024. That will be next week on Tall Guy Talks Travel with Rick Doherty. Until then, have a great week.